Oral questions, question orale, the Honourable Member for Portage Lisker. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' failure to deliver vaccines is costing lives. Recently, 127 residents at the Roberta Place long-term care home in Barrie tested positive for COVID. And by Sunday afternoon, 40 of them had died. And every day without a vaccine leads to the potential for more outbreaks. The Liberals' delivery of zero vaccines this week is completely unacceptable. What is the Prime Minister's answer to the people, especially healthcare workers, and our beloved seniors who won't get a vaccine this week because of his failure to secure them. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, there is an intense competition for vaccines in the world today. In anticipation of this global race, Canada took precautions. We secured the world's most extensive vaccine portfolio from seven companies with 10 doses for every Canadian. That's why Canada has already vaccinated more people per capita than our G7 peers, Germany, Japan and France, and more than our Five Eyes partners, Australia and New Zealand. There is no more urgent issue for this government than getting Canadians vaccinated and together we'll get it done. The Honourable Member for Portage Lisker. Well, we've also just learned that over 335,000 surgeries have been cancelled across the country over the last four months because of COVID. Life-saving surgeries for things like cancer and heart disease or procedures to get people out of immense pain and suffering. The overall health cost to Canadians because of these cancellations could be catastrophic. A vaccine is needed now, not maybe kinda, sorta, in nine months. Again, why are Canadians getting zero vaccines this week? Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, there is no more urgent issue for our government and for Canadians than getting vaccines. That's why over the past few days, the Prime Minister has spoken with the CEOs of Pfizer, AstraZeneca and Moderna. And let me remind Canadians, 1.1 million vaccines are already here. Six million doses will arrive in the first quarter and every Canadian who wants to be vaccinated will be by September. Well, member for Portage Lisker. Well, if there's one thing we know, it's that Liberals are going to keep misleading, misleading Canadians on vaccines. They're refusing to give clear answers on how they're going to fix the vaccine shortage. The vaccine will save lives and bring hope, but we have none arriving in Canada while vaccines go to other countries. People are dying. Surgeries are being cancelled. And last night, a Liberal, Liberal MP said the Liberals are banking on vaccines that haven't been approved yet. This is not a game, Mr. Speaker. Lives are at stake. When can Canadians expect to be vaccinated. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every Canadian who wants a vaccine will get one by September. And we are offering very clear, precise details to Canadians. 1.1 million vaccines have already arrived in our country. 6 million doses will arrive by the end of the first quarter. There is a global race on to get vaccines and Canada is urgently engaged in getting them for Canadians. L'honorable député de Chicoutimi Le Fjord. The honorable member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Yesterday the Liberals unsuccessfully tried to obtain unanimous consent in this house to adopt a bill to correct the mistakes in their unduly hasty bill which gave $1,000 to non-essential travelers for their quarantine. Clearly, this House decided that it would be better to properly study the legislation with debate and studying committee. We want to know why this bill has not yet been introduced. The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this program was never designed to encourage Canadians to ignore clear public health directives against international travel. We are taking immediate measures to resolve this issue to ensure that international travelers returning to Canada cannot access that benefit. It is very unfortunate that opposition MPs blocked our attempt to close that loophole. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi de Fjord. Mr. Speaker, as we frequently seen before, this government is asking us to rush bills through the House 
without giving us a chance to do our work. We frequently find ourselves having to review bills which we wouldn't have had to do if we'd studied them properly in the first place. This is a new year. Will this government make a new year's resolution to do things properly this time and to enable us to debate this bill so we don't end up giving a thousand bucks to non-essential travelers? The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government's position is clear. No one should be traveling abroad at this time. And our government's position on this loophole is equally clear. We want to close the loophole and we want to do that now. It is truly unfortunate that opposition MPs do not agree. The Honorable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, once upon a time, this Deputy Prime Minister wouldn't have twisted the words of opposition MPs, who are simply saying that we should debate this bill. This bill should be retroactive. The moment when it is adopted is not important. What's really important is the moment it goes back to. Now, quarantine, flight restrictions, refunding tickets for people whose trips were canceled, those are all government responsibilities. Will this government shoulder its responsibility, responsibilities? The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this program was not designed to encourage Canadians to ignore clear public health guidelines against international travel. Let me be very clear today. No one should be vacationing abroad at this time. We believe that together we need to take responsibility and we need to close this loophole. We want to do it now and we can. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, this program wasn't created to prevent people from traveling. But the changes to the program is not going to refund those, is not going to recompense those who ultimately traveled. I think that should be clear, and the Deputy Prime Minister should take that to her boss. Now, I have another question. Why? In a phone call that was clearly a failure between the Prime Minister and the American President, why in this phone call did the Prime Minister not ensure that he finds sources for the Pfizer vaccine in Michigan, where we could practically go on a quick bicycle ride? The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I have a great deal of respect for the leader of the bloc. And we have worked effectively together on many issues, such as aluminum. That is why I want to express my deep disappointment in the leader of the bloc for having doubled down on his false remarks regarding my colleague, the Minister of Transport. And I would like to give him the chance to apologize publicly to my colleague in this house, the Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The COVID-19 crisis continues in our long-term care centers. Our seniors need the vaccine. Without access to the vaccine, more seniors will die. My question is simple. When are we going to vaccinate our seniors? The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. There is intense global competition on vaccines, as we have always known would happen. And that is why Canada has purchased the most uh, varied vaccine portfolio in the world. With 10 doses per Canadian and seven different vaccine companies. Canada has already vaccinated more people per, cap cap per capita than our peers in the G20 and the Five Eyes. Vaccines are a priority for our government. Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over 200 doctors 
are calling for urgent action on, in Ontario to address the crisis in long-term care exposed by COVID-19. They're calling for massive reforms, but in particular, they're also calling for removing profit from long-term care. Now, Rivera is one of the largest for-profit providers of long-term care. It is owned by a federal agency. So will the Prime Minister take the first step in removing profit from long-term care by removing profit from Rivera, by making it public and saving lives? Will Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me start by saying that I share the member opposite's concern, his English, over people in long-term care facilities. And I think this is a concern shared by all Canadians. This is something we need to urgently address, and our government is doing just that, working in close collaboration with our provincial and territorial partners. Let me also say that I think it is entirely appropriate for us as a country to examine very, very carefully standards in long-term care, to set national standards, and to examine what kind of care protects our seniors best. Member for Calgary Nose Hill. A majority of the vaccines that the Liberals are banking on will be produced in Europe. But yesterday, it was reported that the European Union is considering export bans, bans to prioritize vaccines for their citizens. In spite of what the Prime Minister said this morning, it's not up to companies to determine this. It's up to EU officials, and they're talking about a ban. If the EU bans exports of vaccines, where will Canada get its supply from? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government and I have been in contact with the European Union on this very important issue. There is not a restriction on the export of vaccines to Canada. We are going to continue to work with the EU, just as we have throughout this pandemic, to make sure that our critical health and medical supply chains remain open and resilient. We share this urgency with Canadians to ensure life-saving vaccines get to Canada, and we're fully engaged to secure the continued deliveries of vaccines to Canada. Honourable Member for Calgary Knows Hill. Well, there might not be a ban at this moment. What's being reported is that the EU is considering a ban in the future. And that's a big deal because Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, they produce the vaccines that are on order for Canada in Europe. So enough with the, there might not be one now. If the Europeans ban exports of vaccines, what's plan B for Canada? Honorable Minister. I want to thank the Honorable Member for that important question. And we absolutely share the urgency with Canadians about getting vaccines to Canada, which is why our government and I have been speaking to my EU counterpart. We're going to keep working with the EU just as we have throughout this pandemic to ensure that our supply chains remain open and that important, uh, something so important like vaccines and the continued delivery of them makes its way to Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Deputy de Charbourg, Haute Saint Charles. The Honourable Member for Charbourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, this morning we learned in the media that the EU is threatening to block coronavirus vaccine exports to countries outside its borders, such as Canada. This is after AstraZeneca announced a significant reduction in the doses promised to member states. Can the Prime Minister confirm that he picked up his phone this morning to call the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, to ensure that the planned deliveries to Canada will not be delayed? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, our government and I have been in contact with the EU. We are continuing to work with the EU. There is no export restriction on vaccines to Canada. This is an important issue. We will continue to work with the European just as we have throughout the pandemic to ensure that critical supply chains like vaccines continue to make its way to Canada. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, we've known that we couldn't fully trust what this government is telling us. 
My question here is for the Prime Minister. Did he himself pick up the phone to call the President of the European Commission to get answers? Yes or no? Sure. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for that question. Our government has been in contact with the EU, and we are working with the EU just as we have throughout this pandemic. It is important that supply chains continue to be resilient and continue to be open, and we understand and we share the urgency as uh, with the Honourable Member about getting access to this life-saving vaccines to Canada as quick as possible, and we're fully engaged to ensure that we secure the continued deliveries of vaccines to Canada. The Honourable Member for Battleford's Lloyd Minster. Mr. Speaker, it is unacceptable that Canada is getting zero doses of the Pfizer vaccine this week, not when other countries are not having their supply slashed to zero. It's Canadians who will pay for the delays caused by their poor planning and bad negotiations. And it is our seniors, those who care for them, and their families who will pay the highest price. Lives and livelihoods depend on the timely access of vaccines. Mr. Speaker, what is the government going to do to fix the vaccine shortage? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear about our schedule of vaccine deliveries, and that schedule is the same. We will re be receiving 6 million doses before the end of Q1, and we will be con continuing to ramp up deliveries such that Canadians who want a vaccine will be able to access one by the end of September. This is information we've supplied consistently with Canadians, and this is information that we will continue to supply. The Honourable Member for Battleford's Lloyd Minster. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're getting zero vaccines this week, and their plan is so clear that their own members can't make sense of it. The Prime Minister needs to come clean about why Canada's supply is being slashed more than other countries and how that's being addressed. If we aren't hitting our targets now, that offers Canadians little assurances going forward. We know that every delay has a cost, a cost for families who will lose loved ones, for the seniors facing isolation, and for the frontline workers who are just plain exhausted. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister finally release the full details of the negotiated contracts? We know, full Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that 1.1 million doses of vaccines have already entered Canada, that that number is among the best in the G20, that that number will continue to ramp up to 6 million in the first quarter and continue right throughout the year so that all Canadians who wish to receive a vaccine by the end of September will be able to receive a vaccine. This is information that we've shared on numerous occasions through you, Mr. Speaker, to the opposition and through you to Canadians. We will continue to do so. There is no greater priority for this government than ensuring the successful conclusion of a vaccine, vaccine program for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchers. Mr. Speaker, Everyone is waiting for Ottawa to ban non-essential travel, to monitor quarantines, to close the borders and refund people who are cancelling trips. And yet, this Prime Minister has the gall to hold a press conference to announce what? Nothing at all. It's ludicrous, Mr. Speaker. He got the media together and he didn't have anything to announce. Mr. Speaker, at this point, we can see that the Prime Minister is never going to show some level of responsibility. Quebec is now asking for the authority to punish those who are not respecting quarantine rules. Will this government at least let Quebec take action? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, since March 2020, we have asked Canadians to reconsider their and to, to cancel their discretionary travel. We also have banned foreign travelers to Canada, and now we're requiring travelers coming into Canada to be tested and to have a negative COVID test before arriving. As the Prime Minister has said, we are also exploring further options to make sure that we are uh, containing the spread of virus and doing everything we can to protect the health of Canadians. Honorable Deputy de Pierre Boucher. The Honorable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchers. Mr. Speaker, the federal government doesn't seem to be able to ban on essential travel. It doesn't seem to be able to oblige air transport carriers to refund people who have canceled their trips. And it doesn't seem to be able to monitor quarantine. In fact, it's so unable to do anything that the government of Quebec has offered to help by punishing people who are re not respecting quarantine rules. And yet the, gov the government doesn't seem to be able to accept Quebec's help. 
Can this government at least get out of the way and let Quebec help? Honorable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as uh, uh, the member opposite knows, every step of the way, our uh, response at the border and indeed in fighting this pandemic has been led by science and evidence. Immediately uh, in the spring, we took measures to screen at the border and further strengthened with the need for mandatory isolation and quarantine when people arrived uh, from international travel. And Mr. Speaker, we've strengthened the quarantine, we've monitored people in quarantine, and we encourage all law enforcement officers to use their tools to help enforce quarantine. It is an important part of reducing importation. And Mr. Speaker, finally, I'll just say, uh, we remind Canadians now is not the time to travel. Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, first the U.S. administration cancelled Keystone XL. Now they have announced Buy America policies on their government procurement. This will be devastating to our exports of Canadian aluminum, steel, and many manufacturing and wholesale sectors who rely on integrated supply chains with the United States. What is the Prime Minister doing to ensure Canada is exempted from these policies? Or will he again just express his disappointment like he did with Keystone? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, to Canadian businesses and workers, I want you to know that we are actively engaging with our American partners at all levels and will always stand up for the best interest of Canadians. The Prime Minister spoke to President Biden and, uh, and they affirm that they will and we will be working together, consulting closely. Canada and the U.S. share a unique relationship. We're going to continue working with our Canadian businesses, our exporters. We're going to take a Team Canada approach. We've been doing this for the last five years, and we're going to keep doing that to ensure that we are working with our neighbour to create good jobs in North America. Well, member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, well, when the U.S. put in Buy America policies in 2009, the Conservative government secured an exemption agreement so that Canadian businesses and workers were protected. We need similar leadership now. Canadian manufacturers and exporters have said that these Buy America policies may force them to move across the border, taking tens of thousands of jobs with them. Is this government pursuing an exemption agreement with the United States to protect Canadian workers? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and the President agreed that we will consult closely and work closely. We understand that both countries benefit from the integrated, secure and resilient supply chains between our two countries. Canada is the number one customer for more than 32 states. We look forward to working with the American administration for the interests of Canadian workers and Canadian businesses here in Canada, indeed on both sides of the border. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister talks a big game, but he's collecting failures at every term. He's failing on Indigenous reconciliation, failing on the environment, and failing on job creation when he fails to support Keystone XL with the new U.S. administration. Everyone knows pipelines are safer and cleaner than rail to transport oil and gas. Designed as net zero emissions, Keystone XL ticked all the boxes. Yet this Prime Minister couldn't find it in his schedule to make it a priority. Why did he not fight for the Canadian workers who depend on these jobs. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are not happy about this decision. We made a strong argument for this project at every level and in every way we could, from Ambassador Hillman to the Prime Minister. I spoke weekly with Minister Savage and the former member for Edmonton Le Duc, the Alberta Special Representative in Washington, James Rashad. We worked together all through the fall. The governments of Canada and Alberta stood shoulder to shoulder to make the case together. We made the case for Canada and the president has made a decision to honor his campaign commitment. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we know when this Prime Minister wants a file to go his way by the effort he puts into it, such as SNC-Lavalin, where he bent every rule to save jobs at one company. Surely Keystone XL workers deserve more than a quick chat. Mr. Speaker, Canada is facing another energy crisis. This one could hit Ontario and come back hard. Michigan wants to kill Enbridge Line 5. This pipeline supplies Ontario and Quebec's industries on which thousands of workers and their families depend. Will this government stop sitting on its hands or are we going to add another trophy 
to the Prime Minister's failure collection. Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, President, Bi President Biden's decision uh, to rescind the permit for KXL has no impact on Enbridge's Line 5 or Line 3 replacement projects. These pipelines continue to operate. These are projects to modernize existing energy infrastructure. They are driven by safety and good labor jobs. Both of these projects have been repeatedly validated by the U.S. Pipelines and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Timmins, James Bay. This is the fifth anniversary of the historic Human Rights Tribunal ruling that ordered this Liberal government to end their systemic discrimination against First Nations children. And yet the Prime Minister's obstruction has resulted in eight non-compliance orders, over $8 million in legal fees, and the cost has been paid in children's lives. Children like uh, Chantal Fox, Jolyn Winter, Jenna Roundsky. So when will this Prime Minister just call off his lawyers and do the right thing for First Nations children and end his systemic discrimination against their rights? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, while today is the fifth anniversary of the CHRT order, the inequalities and overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care has spanned for decades. We've been clear our goal is a comprehensive, fair and equitable compensation for those impacted by the historic inequities in First Nations child welfare. Let me be equally clear in saying that currently Canada is facing three competing lawsuits that purport largely to represent the same group of plaintiffs, and we welcome the appointment of a mediator to navigate this process. I would also take the time to highlight the termination this week of birth alerts in Saskatchewan. Well, member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Indigenous Services recently stated that his government does not recognize the jurisdiction of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal on expanding Jordan's principle. He wants consultation instead. Is this minister for real? We are talking about children who have no access to health care supports for the basic and urgent care they need. This is about care for children. I'm asking the minister to not take First Nations children to court again. I'm asking for reconciliation in action, not in words. Minister, please drop the legal action now. Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would highlight for the member opposite the 800,000 supports that Indigenous Services Canada has provided since 2016 in implementing these orders. The appeal of the particular uh, order that the member is referencing will in no way prejudice Indigenous children. We will implement every single aspect of that order, regardless of the outcome. It is part of the competing three lawsuits that this government is facing, purporting to affect the same group of plaintiffs. And we welcome the appointment of the mediator to navigate through this process. Honourable Member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Mr. Speaker, more than two years have passed since Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor were arbitrarily detained, detained in China. The former Minister of Foreign Affairs was right when he said that on the second anniversary of their detention that these are two years that have been stolen from them. Canadians, including all members of this House, remain united in calling for their immediate release so that they can come home and reunite with their families. Can the Minister of Foreign Affairs please provide an update on the government's efforts to make that possible? Full Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to thank the member from Aaron Mills, Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for a very, very important question. Uh, ending the arbitrary detention of Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig is my absolute priority and that of the government, and we will work on this every single day in order to obtain their release. As people will know, uh, the Prime Minister raised the matter with uh, President Biden, who was informed on the subject, and I intend to raise it with my counterpart, Secretary Blinken, uh, as early as this week as a top priority for the Canadian government. We want to get the two Michaels released. Thank you. Well, member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, uh, another question on China. A number of entities, including a subcommittee of this House, two consecutive U.S. administrations and Canada's official opposition have concluded that the government of China is committing a genocide against the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. Yesterday, the minister said the government believes an independent investigation is needed to arrive at that conclusion. Ambassador Ray said something similar before Christmas. So what specific action has the government of Canada taken to initiate an independent investigation. Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, we are gravely concerned with the very strong allegations that have been made against China with respect to its treatment of the Muslim minority Uyghur people and other minorities. We are calling upon China to allow unfettered access to the High Commissioner for Human Rights for the United Nations and also to allow an independent, impartial uh, committee of experts to enter China to have uh, an examination of the situation that exists there to, uh, to, to confirm or not the situation that's been reported. Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, the all-party subcommittee has already conducted hearings and recognized these crimes as genocide months ago. Now the government's talking about an investigation, but clearly in the absence of any action to make that happen, in the meantime, this is simply more obfuscation and delay. The minister knows full well that the same government which lied to the WHO about the spread of COVID-19 is not going to allow unfettered access to members of the International Court of Justice or any other independent investigators. So when will the government put aside the delays and double speak and recognize and respond to this genocide. Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, we are very concerned with the very uh, compelling reports that have come out uh, that uh, point to uh, the treatment of the Uyghur Muslim minority uh, with respect to uh, forced labor uh, camps and uh, and other uh, other uh, excesses uh, which do not respect their human rights. And that is why we want to look at this in detail, and we are urging the Chinese government to allow a full, impartial, independent examination by experts of the situation that exists in Xinjiang province. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lerable. A Canadian who voluntarily leaves a job isn't entitled to employment insurance, but the former Governor General will have a check for life after having resigned, and Canadians are unhappy with that. The main responsibility is the Prime Minister's for this fiasco. He's the one who chose the Governor-General without consulting anyone. Can the, did the Prime Minister promise her $150,000 per year uh, to uh, contain the situation? When will the Prime Minister say that the former Governor-General will not uh, touch any of Canada's uh, taxpayer dollars? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, my colleague knows full well that entire retirement funds are included in legislation. So before inventing anything, he should perhaps consult the law. He knows that it is included there, and that is the amount that the former Governor General was entitled to receive. With respect to, to additional expenditures, the Treasury Board is looking at those expenditures uh, as it usually does, and we will ensure that all expenditures are uh, consistent and... Uh, the Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Mr. Speaker, the list of uh, bad decisions made by the government is really long. We've just learned that the uh, Prime Minister lost face internationally. Bill Morneau resigned from his position at the OECD or his race for the OECD. We know that not enough, he said he didn't have enough support. We know that many people work for him in addition to all of those expenditures. Can the uh, Prime Minister tell uh, Canadians how much uh, taxpayers have spent on this? The Honourable Minister. Mr. President, we have been... Mr. Speaker, we were disappointed to see that Bill Nor Morneau didn't get enough uh, support to become the next uh, Secretary General for the OECD. We felt that Bill Morneau, Morneau was the ideal candidate to, for the job in these difficult times. We want to thank Mr. Morneau for his dedication and his campaign, but also for everything that he did to improve the quality of life for Canadians. Although this isn't uh, the uh, outcome we'd hoped for, we will be working with the next uh, Secretary General for the OECD, who will be chosen by its members. Uh, deputy. The Honourable Member for saint saint bagot Mr. Speaker, Pfizer in Europe can't deliver a single dose of vaccine to Canada. No problem, we should be able to turn to Pfizer in the U.S., but we can't. 
We can't because the Trump administration has decreed that Pfizer has to vaccinate Americans first and foremost before exporting any doses. But there's a new president in the U.S., and the prime minister talked to him. He talked to him last Friday. Did the prime minister ask Joe Biden for an exemption for Canada, at least for the time during which a Pfizer is paralyzed in Europe? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we've repeated on several occasions, has said, we have the most diversified vaccine portfolio. We have reached agreements with Pfizer. Yes, we are waiting for 4 million doses, doses from Pfizer in the first quarter. And that number will increase throughout 2021. As a result, all Canadians who wish to be vaccinated will be able to be so by the end of September. That remains the case, and I want to reassure the member, as well as all Canadians, of that. The Honourable Member for Santiago said Bagot. Mr. Speaker, the United States is our best trading partner. Logically, it should also be our best uh, health partners as well. Vaccination is going to help boost our economy, but also theirs, because both of them are integrated. The Prime Minister talked to Joe Biden after agreeing to concessions on Keystone XL and on the Buy American Act, he needed to ask for something in return. You know what that's called? It's called the art of negotiation. Did he seize the opportunity to ask the president to intervene in favor of uh, vaccine access for Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I share the sense of urgency being expressed by the Honourable Member to have all Canadians vaccinated. It's something that we share as a government on all levels. The Prime Minister speaks with world leaders and with CEOs of large pharmaceutical companies. We share that concern with them and as the Minister and myself. Every day we get down to work for Canadians and all Canadians who wish to be vaccinated will be able to do so by the end of September. For South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, it has been one year since the senseless preventable death of 22-year-old Marilyn Levesque in Quebec City by a convicted murderer who had brutally killed his wife, yet was out on day parole so he could satisfy his, quote, sexual needs, end quote. We now know from a report released last week by correctional and parole officials that there were warning signs that were missed in this case. Does the Prime Minister accept responsibility for the failures of correctional services in the tragic death of Marilyn Levesque. Honourable Minister. Anyone? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Uh, President, Mr. President, actually, there are currently difficulties technical près de. There are currently technical difficulties preventing our colleague from answering. He will have to answer the question later. I think that he is perhaps ready. You both started at the same time. We'll go to the Minister of Justice. I'm not sure if he would like to hear the question again. No. All right. On va la répondre après. Inaudible. Stop. Okay, c'est bon. Uh, une fois qu'on a résolu le problème technique. Well, once the technical issue is resolved, we'll go back to him for the answer then. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government likes to make hurried announcements and then take their slow time implementing critical support programs such as the highly affected sector credit availability program. Hardest hit businesses, especially those in Canada's travel and tourism industry, are relying on HASCAP, which was announced nearly two months ago. Just moments ago, we found out that applications for HASCAP will finally open on February 1st. Will the Prime Minister and this government apologize to those who have been hardest hit for taking their time to implement this much needed program? Good question. Old Minister. Mr. Speaker, I share 
the concerns that the honorable member has for our businesses across Canada, particularly those that have been so hard hit because of the pandemic. And I thank them for their contribution to help all of us stay safe and to flatten this curve. This much needed program is another lifeline to help our businesses get loans 100% guaranteed between 25,000 to a million dollars and up to 6.25 million dollars for those that have multiple locations. I look forward to continuing to working with our businesses so that they get the help that they need through this very difficult time to the other side of COVID-19. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Lisette Chemin Levy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We shouldn't be paying billions to subsidize cruise ship repairs. We're facing a great deal of debt, and the Liberal government wants to invest $3 billion in a shipyard in the West. And this has caused outrage for the Canadian Fed Taxpayers Federation and the shipbuilding industry. Are the Liberals trying to buy votes with borrowed money? Why are they sabotaging the shipbuilding strategy? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président, I come. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague knows full well, we are assessing a, a third shipyard for the shipbuilding strategy on behalf of Canadians. Unlike the government he represented, we are have put getting ships in the water. We are continuing our work in Canada as we did at Davie with the icebreakers. I thank the honourable member for his interest, and I assure him that we will continue with Canada's successful shipbuilding strategy. Scarborough Centre. Mr. Speaker, a survey by the Canadian Race Relations Foundation found racialized Canadians are three times more likely to be exposed or targeted by violence on social media. This can lead to hate crimes, which are up by 7% this year. Four years ago, six people were murdered at the mosque in Quebec City, a crime motivated by Islamophobia and xenophobia, a perpetrator radicalized through a social media environment that amplifies hateful messages in a way never seen before. As the Minister of Canadian heritage is responsible for creating new regulations for social media platforms. Could he please update us on his work to protect Canadians online? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the member for Scarborough Centre for her question. The conclusions of this survey are clear. Hate speech has no place in our society. It is time to step up against online hate. The numbers are disturbing, but they come as no surprise. Almost half of Canadians either report either experiencing or seeing violent or hateful content online. Canadian wants us to act, and that's exactly why we intend to introduce legislation. Our approach will require online platform to eliminate illegal content such as hate hate speech, terrorist and violent extremism, child pornography, and a non-consensual sharing of intimate images online. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Foothills. The cancellation of Keystone XL is another blow to Alberta's energy workers and Canada's economy, but is also a huge step backwards in our fight to protect the environment. Keystone XL checked all the boxes. Renewable energy to power the pipeline? Check. Emissions neutral? Check. Agreements with First Nations equity partners? Check. TC Energy did everything it was asked, and it still wasn't good enough for this Prime Minister. So if this Prime Minister won't stand up and fight for Keystone XL, why should energy workers ever believe this Prime Minister will stand up for another pipeline or their livelihoods? All Minister. Mr. Speaker, we fought every step of the way with the government of Alberta. We fought uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we made our case, and we did so with them every step of the way, knowing that if we did that together, that their chances of success would increase. We were both proud of this project. We believe it checked off all the boxes. The president, in this case, has decided to keep his campaign commitment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kootenai, Columbia. Mr. Speaker, far too many seniors in BC's long-term care homes are without emotional, mobility, or decision-making support. There are only 8,000 people with essential senior visitor status in BC, supporting only 24% of 
of an estimated 34,000 residents in licensed long-term care. 26,000 seniors live without essential support. Mr. Speaker, Health Canada has already approved a solution. When will the government allow rapid testing at long-term care facilities so we can move to provide seniors with safe access to healthy family members? Honourable Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'll just say that, in fact, we have uh, not only approved rapid tests, but shipped over 15.4 million rapid tests to provinces and territories to date, including 1.5, almost 1.5 million to BC alone. Uh, provinces and territories have also received guidance. And most recently, uh, a, a document from a testing and screening expert panel on how best to use these rapid tests to screen in long-term care. I agree with the member opposite. It's important that provinces and territories have the tools they need to protect people living in long-term care from the introduction of COVID-19. The Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, our country is battling a mental health crisis. It's been over one month since this House unanimously passed my motion calling on the government to consolidate all provincial suicide uh, prevention hotlines into an easy to remember national suicide prevention hotline using a three digit, a simple three digit number. With the passage of this motion, it is now up to this government to work with the provinces and industry to develop a plan to bring 988 to Canada. Minister, where's the plan? Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his constant advocacy for mental health supports. I will remind all Canadians that we do have wellnesstogether.ca. It is an online portal that is available in both official languages and translation into 60 so that people can get immediate mental health and substance use uh, supports no matter where they live in this country. Uh, in terms of working towards an easy three-digit number, the member knows that my department Department is tasked and seized with this issue, and I am looking forward to continuing our hard work together to make it a reality. The Honourable Member for Marcorel Fortin. Oh. There appear to be technical problems again today. Okay, alors. Uh... On va essayer encore. We'll try again. Ça fonctionne parce que tantôt, on l'a entendu. Oui, À la prochaine, we'll go on to the next... We'll go on to the next question and then come back uh, to this one later. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Mr. Speaker, last summer this government said we'd be receiving vaccines last fall. In the fall, they told us to expect vaccines in the winter. And now, in the winter, they're telling us to wait until next spring. This government received no new shipments in uh, COVID this week. And now we're hearing that the EU is looking to stop vaccines from leaving Europe, something that will devastate our ability to get through this pandemic. So forgive us if we're unwilling to take their word for it. I'll have to ask again. With the possibility of even more cancelled deliveries, what's the plan B to getting vaccines into Canadians? Because it's clear that the Liberals' plan A has failed. Herbal Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, plan A through Z has been to have the most diversified vaccine portfolio in the world. That's what we've done. We've announced deliveries of 6 million vaccines in the first quarter, and that will be ramping up right through the end of Q3, by which time we have told all Canadians who wish to receive one that they will have access to a vaccine. That is the story that we have told Canadians. Unfortunately, different versions of that story come from the other side of the House. But our story on this side of the House is very, very consistent, Mr. Speaker. Every Canadian who wishes to receive a vaccine will have one by the end of September. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Granville. Mr. Speaker, three months ago, I asked a question about the use of the Emergencies Act. Today, COVID cases continue to rise with new strains emerging. Provincial responses are inconsistent. The rules are confusing and not all federal funds available are being used. 
Border control and travel restrictions are an issue. Vaccine deployment must be coordinated and swift. The next six months are critical. I understand the Minister of Foreign Affairs says he's not ruled out the use of the Emergencies Act to limit travel. We need leadership. Will the Prime Minister now consider invoking the Emergencies Act to do whatever it takes to help protect the health and safety of Canadians? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as as my honourable, I thank my honourable colleague for her question. As as she very well knows, there are a number of of different uh, um, requirements that go along with the Emergencies Act. We are obviously uh, looking at all options, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs has said publicly, uh, in response to this crisis. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of this crisis, we have focused on listening to our health experts working hand in hand with them and hand in hand with the provinces, uh, as well as municipalities, as well as indigenous leadership in order to make sure that we, we fully attack uh, every element of this crisis. The Emergencies Act is one option, Mr. Speaker, which, which has possibilities, but we are looking at all possibilities, Mr. Speaker, in order to serve Canadians. Okay, we had a little bit of a hiccup. Uh, what we're going to do is give it another shot. Uh, the Honourable Member for South Surrey White Rock, if she can ask her question again, and hopefully we can connect with the appropriate minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the chance to say my question again. Thank you. So it has been a year since the senseless, preventable murder of 22-year-old Marilyn Levesque in Quebec City by a convicted murderer who had brutally killed his wife, yet was out on day parole so he could satisfy his, quote, sexual needs, end quote. We now know from a report released last week by corrections and parole officers that warning signs were missed in this case. Does the Prime Minister accept responsibility for the failures of correctional services to prevent the tragic death of Marilyn Levesque? Honourable Minister. The Minister of Justice just answered the last question. Uh, the Honourable Minister, uh, I'm just going to try my technical uh, background here. If you Mr. check Speaker, on it, there's a mute am, on the screen uh, and there's also a mute on the, on the uh, headset. Sometimes they're, one is on and the other one is off. Please check the one on your headset. Make sure it's not uh, uh, on. No, nope, that's Mr. not Mr. Speaker, may I, ah. is, is that making working better? There we go. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity to answer this very important question. In the immediate aftermath of this terrible tragedy, a board of investigation with two external co-chairs was stood up to determine the facts and to provide recommendations in this case. Correction Services Canada and the Parole Board have announced very concrete actions underway following the release of that report, which was made public. All recommendations have been accepted as part of our commitment to do everything possible to ensure this terrible tragedy never happens again. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Well, now try again with the Honourable Member for marc fortin if he would like to ask his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Intolerance and hatred have no place in a free and democratic society. That's why everyone including the former Bloc Québécois leader Gilles Duceppe, was shocked by the dangerous comments made a few weeks ago by the MP for belle chambly and the current leader of the Bloc. Does the minister agree that as parliamentarians, it is our duty to lead by example and engage in respectful dialogue? L'honorable ministre. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree entirely with the Honourable Member for Marc Aurel Fortin. Insinuation of intolerance and hate are intolerable uh, in Quebec and across the country. We cannot allow partisan games create, to create a hostile crisis. Today, the bloc leader added on to his former remarks, which were regrettable, instead of apologizing. This is uh, far from honorable. It is. Uh, D disrespectful and not worthy of a leader. 